up from above uh, at the city. And again, look at the choice of colors, right? The, the, the children here are almost the color of the background. They don't have a color themselves. Right, uh, and the saturation of color, the orange and the blue is coming from the clothes, from the patterns, from the buildings. And this question of color, okay, what is the place of color? Uh, we're gonna see coming up again and again. And we're seeing here this digital drawing genie, which actually comes from just uh, this, um, I'd say, uh, um, very light twinkly kind of uh, thought of what would happen if uh, an Ethiopian mother would rub the coffee pot. They, so for those of you who know, this is a traditional uh, Ethiopian coffee, coffee pot. And we can see in this uh, illustration also a kind of meeting point between quite a few cultures because the rubbing of the pot obviously draws us to Aladdin, which takes us all the way to Walt Disney, but actually it comes from Arabian night, but we've all grew up on it. And here it's coming out of uh, an, a traditional Ethiopian coffee pot. So if you just imagine that whole cycle I described, we're talking about things that kind of uh, come out and grow from a very, very mixed um, upbringing and culture. Okay, so um, we're moving here into works from uh, uh, the current exhibition uh, in Tel Aviv Museum of Art. And I'll slowly tie in uh, between the illustration and the paintings, but I will say that since her studies, Tigist has been painting um, uh, and studying with two major Israeli artists, Phil Lachman and David Nipo, studying, studying painting with them for years and years and cultivating her own practice. Um, and the major part of her practice uh, in these years has been working with charcoal. And we'll talk about the material in a moment, but first in this portrait, I want you to notice a few things and that's mainly the light. Right? When we talk about light, it's very hard not to think about Renaissance paintings, right? Um, we see here the very, very shiny earring and the light coming in from the side and everything we're seeing. And if you remember also the pastel, we're also seeing really the edges of the charcoal here. And I wanna show you a couple of details. First of all, if you remember the still from video I started with suddenly, you can see the relationship, that black and white, the light falling on that doorstep and the patterns. Suddenly when we take a still from the image, it becomes clear where that's happening and where that's coming from. It almost also reminds, reminds us of that still. I'm kind of tempted to go all the way back in the uh, presentation just to show that to you, but hopefully you have that image in your mind. And the other thing I want you to notice is this, um, and I'd say it's a huge difference from the difference from the illustration, because looking at this detail, it's almost impossible to say, okay, what am I seeing here? But if I go back for a moment, here we clearly, absolutely clearly see the knee, right? But the moment I go in, it falls apart. And in this way with the charcoal, I'd say Tigis practice is kind of completely split. One gives us clear cut lines where the image is um, defined and the other builds from, uh, from, I'd say there are lines, we're gonna see them, but it builds from light and from material, an image that when we go very, very close might fall apart, but when we stand back, it all comes together very, very clearly and very delicately. And the charcoal in that way is also an extremely generous, I'd say also difficult, but generous medium, uh, since we see everything, right? We see all the lines, we see all, all the extractions. It's not like the digital drawing where what we get is the end result after everything was clean, but rather in this one, uh, we get the full process. And another detail I think, which is interesting to look like, and also gives you a kind of understanding of the, I'd say the, the, the different qualities uh, that are extracted from the charcoal, because you can see here this very, very clear black line, this ability to just mark it, right? One moment. 
And again, if we look back now, we can notice it, right? There's something very confusing, I'd say, about uh, seeing paintings on our screen. Uh, and I encourage you, the moment you can go to a museum, to do this exercise where you go close to the painting and then you go far back. And for me, very often, one of the things that determine if the painting is good or not is if it holds in both distances. If I get, if I receive something when I come very close and I receive something when I'm standing back and you can see in these works and we'll see it time and time again, that they kind of, uh, they give very, very different feelings depending on the distance we are from these works. We're looking here at three portraits hanging together in the, in the museum, um, Frey, a self-prodded of Tigist and Chirut, which is uh, uh, Tigist's younger, younger sister. Um, and again, here you can see the different ways of using the charcoal. And also, if you look at the size, these are very, very large paintings. Um, and here we already come to this um, idea or thought of what it is to have large paintings of Black women in the museum. And I'm saying that, and now again, I want to touch on this, this, um, this choice of charcoal, because charcoal is Black as a material, right? Uh, and Tigist here is wor working with dark and light, but the Black isn't like a Black color, it's the material. And in this way, the Black and white is constantly talking with the Blackness of the skin, um, but also just with the choice of medium and what, how we're all kind of, once we, we look at it like this, it's just dark and light and how the shapes and forms comes, come together. Um, we're going to continue to these three portraits. And just before I talk about them, you can see also the difference in the way they're painted. And it's really interesting to see we're all here. It's all charcoal. It's all the same. Uh, medium and yet the ways that Tigist uses them and uh, for each portrait is completely, completely different. Uh, these portraits are also slightly smaller, so a little confusing on the screen because I made them as big as the previous ones, but they are uh, slightly smaller. And we're looking at three portraits, male portraits. Um, and before I talk about who they are, I just wanted to look for a moment at the difference in the way each of them is painted uh, or drawn, I'll say like this, uh, right? So again, all charcoal, but very three very different ways of painting. The light comes in differently from each of them. And also in each of them, different features are the striking ones while others are kind of disappearing from the back or some are appearing from the blackness to the forefront. So each of them is, um, is addressed in a very, very different way, just in terms of the drawing themselves. Then if we look at the title, we see there's some kind of uh, um, uh, synchronization between the title, right? Fairness's son, Agrenish's son, and Mamiya's son. And you can see here the titles below. These, through, these three portraits were exhibited first in 2019 in the gallery in Sapil, and later in the permanent collection of the Tel Aviv uh, Museum of Art, and they actually depict uh, three specific young men, uh, Yuda Biadga, and you can see here the Zal, and Yosef Salamsa, both um, uh, killed due to police brutality. Um, uh, Bi Yuda Biadga in 2019 and Yosef Salamsa in 2014. Uh, and um, Avela Mangisto, who is since 2014 missing, uh, and he basically crossed over the border to Gaza and is believed to be uh, a captive uh, in the hands of Hamas and hasn't been seen since. Um, and we have here a, a few very, very powerful choices. And I'll start with the titles that Tigis chose to to give them. And if you look at the titles, she didn't name them by their own name, but she named them by their mother. And there are a few very powerful things uh, in this. Um, and I, I just, 
it's it's interesting. I always had one thought about this, and now suddenly another thought came to mind that when uh, in Judaism, when we pray for someone, we pray for them using their mother's name, not using their father's name uh, in Judaism. So already a really interesting thing uh, that connects us to tradition. I don't know if Tigis thought of that. I know I hadn't until like a few seconds ago, and I realized that actually uh, uh, praying for someone's health is always uh, saying the person's name and the son of and saying their mother's name. The other thing that is very powerful in this choice saying, um, calling someone the son of, is that especially in Israel, there's this term uh, saying haben shel kulanu. It, he's the son of all of us. And it was a very prominent saying when Gilad Shalit was held cup, captive and when there were signs all over the country uh, that he's the son, he belongs to all of us. He's the son of all of us. And uh, Tigist with the choice here of using this phrase is also touching on that because she's bringing to the surface kind of a double, I'd say a double pain. One pain is the pain of the loss, uh, uh, the dying of these two young men and the missing of this young man. And one is that loss, but the other is also that feeling of being ignored by Israeli society um, and not remembered, not addressed, fighting that fight against police brutality, against racism, uh, and just even the, the not being seen in that way. Um, and there's another layer here, which we'll see will, is going to come in more and more in Tigis works, which is also just the very, um, I'd say, straightforward um, uh, relation and saying, and since Tigis is her mother herself, realizing that these young men have mothers and touching on this, and we'll see in, in the works that we're gonna see in the whole exhibition, how much this place of a mother, being a mother, being a daughter, being in a lineage of women uh, is so um, prominent to her works. And so the titles themselves also give it uh, so much strength. Um, and, and again, I mean, if you think these three portraits and these three portraits were not done together and were not, um, uh, as far as I know, were not thought of together, but just seeing the three and the three to me is very uh, powerful. Uh, we're moving on and we're moving kind of through Tigis family and, and I'm hopefully managing to give you both the story, but also her amazing uh, abilities and, the, and how, how drawing, how painting, how art can tell stories in a very different way. So we're seeing here two images of her grandmother and we're seeing two very, very different ways of portraying a person, right? Suddenly the word portrait makes sense, right? It's portraying someone. And we can see here the, the dark lines, the clarity, you can see here the, the black background against this white dress, the nobility, of and we're looking at her grandmother and the very I'd say proud chin up gaze. Um, it, we're getting the full character and it's very direct, very hard. And you can see also the choice to paint in, in that way is giving us all of that force. And then when we look at this portrait, which is the same woman, right? And we see here that the choice and um, I want you to start first from looking just at the relation between the portrait and the background, right? It's melting in, it's, it's kind of fusing together. There is so much softness, the, the lines aren't as clear cut. It's not as, uh, there isn't, this is where the background end and this is where the subject begins, but rather it happens together and her features are kind of appearing from within, but also at the same time disappearing, it's much more difficult to capture uh, the portrait in this one. And what we'll look at for a moment is um, uh, Tigis' grandmother was a potter 
uh, and Tigister herself comes from a family of 12, uh, where 12 uh, kids, um, and with a lot of talent, uh, growing up with arts and crafts around her, both from a grandmother and a mother, with uh, four of her siblings going into various art forms. Uh, whether it's architecture or design or painting, so a, an extremely creative family. Um, and we're looking here at an excerpt from a much longer poem uh, by Tigis's brother, Yosef Enyu. Um, and this poem touches on the pottery and it's very, very on the pottery of the grandmother, but also um, could be, I'd say applied very much to the choice of charcoal. So I'm gonna read a little of it and create this connection between the pottery and the medium that Tigist uses. But perplexed, she asks, is it really just a pot, that which is made to be, rhythmic to beat with time every minute, durable to survive, lifeless but alive, revealing of time's event, broken or intact, capable of shading light on civiliz civilizations of the past, archeology's span delight and history's searching light, humanity's footprint, humanity's footprint, can it just be a pot? And I'm gonna skip here to this part over here. And then she inductively infers, clay is just an illusion not the essence of our creation, be it in a tissue or cell or in the molecular atoms or in earth continents and in the universe earth, the void is the medium, the form and the platform upon which and in which all events take form. So, yeah, I feel I need to be silent for a moment just because it's beautiful. Um, the void is the medium the form and the platform upon which and in which all events take form. The choice of charcoal to me is very, very close to this choice of clay. The material itself is organic, very basic. There's nothing flashy about it. And you can go anywhere with it as long as you remember that the absence and the presence of it are creating the image together. To see a little bit of how this plays out, we're gonna look at this next work, Mallows. Uh, Mallows, in Hebrew, it's Hubeza. It's a plant um, that uh, exists here in Israel, but also in Ethiopia. Uh, and we're seeing here uh, Tigis's brother uh, in one of his visits after he found the plant and she kind of saw him sitting with that. And in this case, I must say, I almost don't need the story. Like I, I, I can put it aside. There's the image of this man full of light holding something, which I don't necessarily know what it is, but a flower, a plant. And it, I mean, if you just try and sit like that for a moment in your chair, there's this delicacy that comes up. And if you look again, uh, there's almost no clear black in this work. We're looking at shades and shades and shades and shades of gray. Um, it's almost as if the image itself is appearing and disappearing simultaneously. There's no line that is holding it clearly in place. And in that way, it touches also on this idea of memory of how do we hold memory? Because specifically in this moment, Tigis was like seeing what was in front of her and her brother as he's in old human being like grown up, but also remembering the childhood and in this way of drawing it without giving it the definitive lines, it's kind of uh, shimmering in front of us and holding both the present and the memory uh, at the same time. We're moving on. Um, if you remember, I mentioned that uh, in 2015, Tigis, I think it was 15, Tigis, correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, Tigis visited uh, Ethiopia, went back to Gondal where she grew up and started looking and seeing the women there. And after a lifetime of growing up here and spending a lot of energy on becoming fully Israeli, being an officer in the army and going through the whole process of becoming very, very Israeli, um, she noticed when she was uh, walking in Ethiopia and seeing the women there, how much the way she carries herself and her body is actually connected 
to that place, to her birthplace. Um, and she started taking photos of these women later to, to paint them. Just these, these um, the actions themselves. Um, and we're seeing here another work from Gonda. We're seeing this woman and, and uh, Tigis talks of, of seeing this woman and the way she bends over and seeing how much it resembles the way she herself uh, works in a ha her home and does things. You can also see here how the play between um, the lines and the stains and the white and the black are very, very clear. And again, to me, that's um, it's the generosity of a drawing. Uh, we, we see how the drawing is constructed. Um, and there's another thing in here, which I want us to kind of, we're gonna take a little, a little detour, a little trip, um, <laughs> because Tigis, like, um, like every student that went through Betzalel, uh, was educated in like all of the Western, um, uh, art history, right? That's what we study here. Even though we're in the Middle East, our artistic education is totally Eurocentric. Um, that's what we study. That's what we see. Um, and it's very hard not to see those work and think of this very famous work, uh, The Gleaners, which I'll just mention um, uh, the, there are so many um, references and homages to this work. Uh, Adi Ness is one Israeli photographer who plays with this work, and we're going to see in a moment a play on it. And what's really interesting, and, and I was really happy to find this etching because it allows to understanding, understand it a little more, and also I love etching. Um, so this uh, etching, etching is a older uh, is an old technique where basically through different ways of scratching uh, metal surfaces and then uh, applying ink and printing it um, and many many painters and artists use that um, before and after creating paintings and here since we're seeing this work in black and white it suddenly uh, we can see the striking resemblance um, uh, right with the action, the elegance of it, and the way painters, you know, there's so much in the movement, it's hard to, to ignore it. And what happened after seeing all of that in Gondar and realizing how in there's this embodiment of movement um, and realizing this, this, I'd say, Ethiopian movement within this, uh, Israeli cultivated body and in a westernized society, like all these mixtures come together. And what Tigis chooses to do is to uh, take photos. Most of her works are based on, uh, she takes the photos and then draws them. Photos of herself doing housework, uh, realizing suddenly how the movement holds so much of her heritage and then drawing them. And we see here a few, a few things, I'd say. First of all, again, the choice in each one, where is the image defined? How much is the scene defined in relationship to the image? What are the details that she's giving us? And what remains, um, I'd say, in the dark or for us to imagine? And to me also seeing these works now with all, uh, you know, COVID-19 and spending so much time at home, uh, they become even more uh, powerful to me because these uh, actions um, are not only day-to-day -day life, but they have suddenly become so um, uh, central. And another thing we're seeing here again is the um, very, clear emphasis on women and the the sim I don't have to say the simplicity but but the day-to-day -day being of a woman okay um, and the elegance in it the beauty in it if we're looking yes it's folding ringing and finally chopping but it literally looks like dance movements if we took away um, the the scene and we were left with the uh, character herself, uh, we'd, we'd be looking at dancers very much. 
Um, another work from 2020 that again, um, the eyes, those eyes that came back from Gondar with a new appreciation for movement became also very, very, very sensitive to movement here. And I love the name that Tigis gave to this, um, to this work. Batyam. So, so the story behind this is basically Tigis went to Batyam, if I'm not mistaken, she was visiting her sister and she saw this woman picking uh, potatoes. I don't know if it was potatoes, but it was from a community garden, just picking stuff up and seeing this movement, uh, reminding so much of what she saw in Ethiopia and kind of taking the picture and wanting to paint this. Um, now, if you look again, when we first look at this, it's like, but what am I looking at? Like, where is the image? Is this in focus? Like, where are the lines, right? Um, it, there's like um, this, I'd say this initial kind of, um, the eye gets a little confused. So first of all, I'll help you a little. This is the head, right? We have the back and the hips, and this is the arm and hand stretch picking, and another hand here holding what is already picked, right? So I'm doing that because I think if you remember the illustrations, um, it becomes even more interesting because we know for sure that Tigis, if she really wants to, she'll give us a clear line. <laughs> there's, no, there's no lack of uh, ability but she's not giving us a clear line. She's giving us stains that come together to create an image, but at the same time can, can be seen as complete, complete abstract. And if we look, it's again, many, 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 many tones of gray and hardly any black. The reason I love the name Batyam, Batyam is a city, it's uh, adjacent to Tel Aviv from its uh, southern side, but I love it and I don't think Tigis meant this, but I don't care because I love it. Batyam is also a, a daughter of the sea or um, like a mermaid in Hebrew is Batyam and I, I, oh, um, and I, just, I just love it. Uh, I love this, uh, the elegance of movement uh, that comes in even from the, from the title, even though, yeah, I just, I just made that up. Um, what I didn't make up <laughs> is, another, is another reference here. And what's interesting about this reference, um, it's a reference that is a homage, you can see to the gleaners, which we saw before. Okay, so in, in art that happens very, very, very often where references get played with again and again and kind of acquire more weight with history. And, uh, and you can see here Van Gogh basically going and taking a bit of that uh, Gleaner's work um, and, and choosing one, I'll just show you so you can see, one moment, basically choosing this image and turning her around um, and playing with her. But you can also see the resemblance, right? The, the play of this um, uh, and, and how these things kind of uh, come together in the work. Um, I'm just looking at times, okay. We're, we're almost done so we can move into conversation with Tigist. Uh, so I'll talk about this uh, very shortly. And you can see here again, this. Uh, the mother with two daughters that becomes almost a landscape and maybe even clearer here, which I wanted to show you. My father, this is her father sitting Friday evening off the shower with his book just before Shabbat coming in. But if you didn't know any of that, you might say, oh, I'm looking at a landscape. This isn't necessarily a leg above another knee and a head and a book and a hand on a sofa. This might be just a landscape. Uh, and this play I had to do <laughs> with a work by Uri Reisman from the 60s called Woman Negev. And this play between the intimacy of the body and the, the vastness of a landscape. And this, uh, to, again, this is just me and what I thought of when I was seeing this work. Um, and, and this beauty that comes from, from not being, um, I'd say, glued or tied too closely to the need to portray something in very, very clear lines. 
So just before I open up to a conversation with Tigist, um, this is a, a view from the exhibition currently uh, in the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. So you can see here the portraits uh, I started with. You get an idea of the size and what it feels like to walk into the museum uh, uh, and, and see these portraits hanging. And you can see here this uh, very small portrait, which we're gonna talk about in a moment together with Tigist. Um, and this is just another reference to the name of the exhibition, the white paper is black within. Um, Moshe Gilshuni, one of Israel's very, very, very prominent artists uh, passed away a few years ago, had very often works on paper where what was written, and this is just the translation of what's written here, the paper is white only on the outside, inside it's black. He has many, many works that are using this phrase uh, talking about the whiteness of the page, but inside it being black and the, the reference um, of the title of the, the exhibition very clearly alludes to that. So what we're going to do now, and Tigist, if you can un unmute, um, is basically move into conversation with Tigist. Uh, and before I ask you to talk about this work, I just want you to see can you see these are the portraits and this is a much, much, much smaller portrait that is hanging here on the wall all, all by itself in the museum. Um, and Tigis, thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you, and, and I want to ask you if you can start by telling us about this portrait. Sure, but before that I want to thank you. It was amazing. Even though it's my work and I know my works and the reasoning behind them, it was amazing to hear you doing all the connections. It was really, really great, really br brilliant. Thank you so much. So, um, so this is a, a portrait of my mother. Uh, she passed away when I was 16. And since then, she's, uh, she's a place where I go back and uh, think about and uh, think about myself relatively to her. So I knew when I was doing this uh, exhibition and when I was working uh, for this solo exhibition that she will be the center of the exhibition. Uh, so as you saw before, before in the other slideshow, uh, her photo, her portrait is very small, uh, but it got its own wall with a beautiful frame around it. Uh, and it, she's the center of the exhibition, actually, uh, physically and uh, conceptually. Uh, so all the works uh, in the exhibition, there are 37 pieces, uh, are connected to her in a way. Uh, and in, in this one, we can also see you left kind of the paper it was torn from and also which kind of throws me back to Gershuni a little and also to I don't know, this intimacy of a drawing, like feeling kind of the giving us all of that rather than cutting it into some fine line, but allowing us into that process and that feeling of you being the one drawing this. Exactly. It's like the way in, a, in the way, the way I work with the charcoal is leaving the marks of the material. Uh, so you can see how it, how it looks, how, how it behaves. So it was nice to leave the paper uh, that way. Uh, and it gives you uh, an idea where, how it looked before and uh, it's part of the process. And uh, you can have a, a view of, of the behind the scene kind of thing. So I'm moving on to these three portraits. Uh, can you say a little about them? Uh, yes. Um... The other one that we saw before was, was is very realistic and because it was important to me to catch the essence of my mother and her beauty and her strength. And I worked a lot on it. I really, it was very important to me to catch the way she looked and the way she, she was to me, the strong person that she was. So I worked a lot on it and it came out uh, both uh, open and intensive, but uh, very realistic. And then at the end of me working on the exhibition, I felt more co confident and I started to look for something else, for something more open and more abstract. 
So I did these uh, quicker uh, illustrations, uh, uh, drawings. And every time I let myself feel and draw the way uh, the way it flows and the, the way it captures my feelings or something else in her, in, in my mem memory. So every time it's different and there are other drawings in the studio, every time it came out really differently and these are the best uh, three that are in the museum. So I'm moving to the last painting that I drawing. It's interesting. I find myself calling them paintings rather than drawings. And the definition been, between these is, I'd say, less clear cut. We tend to call anything with charcoal a drawing. But the scale and size of these works and their impact to me are very much sitting in the world of painting. So I think that's why I'm moving between them. Um, so can you tell us a little about the painting and the story behind it? Another thing about that, the difference between them is that uh, usually the uh, artists look at the uh, charcoal drawing as, a, as something that you do at the beginning, just to sketch, and then you go on to the painting. I think a lot don't look at it as something that can hold a whole, uh, a whole uh, uh, drawing, a big drawing with depth and everything. And that's something that I uh, don't agree with because uh, with the charcoal, you can really uh, get a deeper sense of the, of the objects and uh, you can get a lot of color even though there is no color. So it is a painting. Uh, this one is uh, a drawing of my family uh, after we came to Israel, it's the first uh, year. And uh, we are really new here, and uh, and uh, it was important to me because it uh, really captures a specific time in our life, in our um, in our uh, beginning of uh, of life here. When it comes to my relationship with my mother, um, my mother for me in Ethiopia was like she, she was a big figure, strong. She knew everything. She took care of us. I could trust her. And she was this strong uh, figure in my life. And then when it came to Israel, uh, she, I started looking at her differently because I looked at her you know, in the way that the, the Israeli society looked at her. Uh, she wasn't educated. She didn't know the language. So when you look at her in the parameters of the Western society, she wasn't successful. She wasn't strong. Uh, she didn't know enough. So for me, as a child, I understood that to be successful in this new society, I have to, um, I have to change and uh, to become something else, not all the things that my mother um, presented. Uh, all the culture and all the, the language and everything that she came from was something that I need to, to get uh, away from and to start a new uh, way. So, uh, so I'll just maybe add that the name of this uh, painting is Atlit, and Atlit was the place in the absorption center that uh, uh, your family uh, uh, came to and lived in for the first five years uh, in Israel. And actually, this uh, this painting is based on a picture taken uh, for the joint, like for a leaflet. Right. And I was curious to ask you uh, why, like, did you draw it from that picture because that was the best picture you had of your family at that time? Or is it, does it have something to do specifically with it being a picture taken by an outsider? Or like, I'm very curious about, like, because it is in a way taking it back to yourself, appropriating it like back. Yes, I think uh, that because it was taken for, for something uh, external, I think it captures us the way we were frightened, like the way we, we really were. Because I think if uh, someone that we know would have taken the picture, it would have looked uh, different. So I love the way we look strange, we look strangers, we look new because, uh, because someone from outside came to take the picture of us. And uh, the other reason that uh, we are a lot, that we have only one uh, family album. We don't have much pictures. 
My first photo is from the age of uh, seven when we did the photos uh, for our uh, passports to come to Israel. So we have uh, very little photos and this one is very clear and iconic and, uh, and I love it. And we all go back to it, you know, with all my brothers. And also in here, the choices, I mean, it's almost like your mother is the only one who her face is clearer than the rest uh, in, this, uh, in this image. I don't know, uh, like if that was like, because your father, the rest, I mean, we don't get their facial features and with your mother, we do. She's like the one coming forward in this image. Yes, I wasn't planning to give that much information about her face either. It's like the, 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 the best example is my father, the way uh, with the little detail, you can see how proud and uh, protective he is. So I felt yeah, you can see the chin up and the chest out. Yes, and that was enough. But my mother, there's, some, there's a lot of beauty and, uh, and that uh, I guess uh, attracted me to go on and show her uh, cheekbones and uh, but still I, I stopped in, 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 in a in a state that it's not too too much that it's uh, so it won't look too, too weird uh, compared to that to the other figures um, so a last thing before we open up to any questions if there are is just looking at this where basically you took that photo and dissected it to uh, separate portraits of bits and pieces of your family, kind of. And now that you mentioned about not having so many pictures and having one family album, it also seems even more like understandable wanting to, to duplicate, to make more, to, to see each um, in, in more angles uh, and to go into details. I, I don't know, is there, is there, um, like when you did this, can you say something about your thought process behind it? Uh, it's what I did uh, actually was actually following what I was thinking while looking at the pictures. When you look at different parts of it, uh, you see relationships and things and stories with the two person or the three of them. It tells a different story uh, when you uh, divide it to this kind of uh, um, of figures, and uh, it's it's both uh, story-wise and uh, and also how do you say composition? Uh, Composition-wise, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. It's a different challenge, and it's all of a sudden a different thing, a different rhythm of uh, of the charcoal, and uh, different things happen. So it was uh, interesting for me to do it. So. Tigis, first of all, I just want to say thank you so, so much for being with us and sharing uh, all of this. And before I open to see if there are any questions, I also, I, I, I think for me, it's really interesting to see the play between the painting as a story and then putting that aside and experiencing the painting as a painting. And in your works, I feel that comes, it, it, there's a constant play between those, a lot of it due to the way you use the charcoal and how it's between like, I'm seeing a family photo or I'm seeing shapes and the way, the way they construct uh, a face or a body. And it's a very, to me, a very, it's a very pleasurable play between, between the two that you kind of create. And I think a very generous one for the viewer. So thank you very, very, very much. Um, and we have uh, a few minutes for questions. Uh, I don't know if we have any from Facebook or from here or from there, I'm not sure how. Uh, <laughs> uh, Uriah will help us out over here and tell us if we have questions and from where. Thank you so much, Tigis. And thank you, Shirel. There was a question, uh, I don't know, I guess, Rachel, you wrote it about like half an hour ago about where does the pink co coloration in the I, I can charcoal come from, right, Rachel? And uh, I just, I don't know where it was, like it was referring to one of the previous- I think it was one of the first charcoals that we saw. Okay. I mean, there's some of them 
Uh, yeah, slightly different. Tigis, do you want to say something about the different um, colors of the charcoal or shades of them? Uh, yes, it's usually black, but sometimes uh, accidentally you can find the brownish ones. So uh, if you go to the portraits of my mother, mm. I kept those brown, uh, brown ones aside and I did the whole uh, drawing with the brown one, uh, this one, the darker one from uh, next to the window. This one is made uh, from, uh, it's very dark, but it's, uh, it's brown, it's uh, dark brown. Uh, but the others, I so think it's, it's just the, uh, okay. it just the, so I it's can just, it depends maybe on the charcoal. Okay, this is the only one so, that can uh, be mm -hmm. But it's usually black on white, and if you have the, a pinkish the color to the paper, it's something about the, it's, it's the screen or something else. Originally, it's, uh, it's really white yeah. and black. Yeah, there was one that was so distinctive, it almost looked like an overlay of pastel mixed with it. That's why I was asking. It was okay. way back in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, I'm going. It's also just nice to go way back. So uh, ah, are you yeah. talking about this one? I think so. Yeah, it's it's it almost looks that uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing it's a combination of the paper and the photograph and our screens. Uh, and what our eyes do, but now that you've asked that, I, it's it's actually more visible to me too. And now I need to go back and see it in the museum. <laughs> to see. Your work Hopefully is they'll... really, really beautiful, Tigis. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Brittany is writing on Facebook, Tigis, these pieces are stunning. Roughly how long does it take you to draw each one? Well, it's very different from my uh, work uh, different works take different uh, amount of time. Uh, the portrait of my mother took me uh, weeks because I went, I gave up on, him, on it and I went back to it. It took me a lot of time. And in the other hand, there are others that can take me only six hours, like uh, two days that I work three hours each uh, every time because it just flows and the composition is clear to me or whatever I'm feeling is clear. So it's, so it goes on uh, smoothly and, uh, and it's easier. And there is a portrait of me that I did uh, uh, from, uh, from life, from, uh, not from a photo that I did. Uh, you can see them with the three uh, portraits. I did it uh, the whole Shabbat from this one in the middle. I did it all day looking in the mirror and it changed all the time. And every time, once in a while, I gave up on it because it changed too much. But at the end of the, of the day, luckily, it came out uh, strong and, and good and the shapes set really uh, clearly and in a good way. So I was happy with it. But that one took a day almost nonstop from morning to evening. So it's really very different. There's also just, I just realized in charcoal, there's something, I mean, also the everything gets dirty. Everything, the charcoal gets on everywhere. Like it's not, and, but then on the other hand, it's not so easy to set. Like it needs a lot of extra stuff to help it set, to help it stay. There's something of the transience of charcoal and the way you touch it and you're touched by it, which again brings me back to the clay um, very yes, closely. It's very physical. And uh, I learned the hard way that you need a, a little bit of texture on the, on the paper for it to hold and stay. Because if it's too smooth, then you really work hard to make it stay. So first of all, you have to get the right paper and then you just need to know how to work with it in a way that you don't, you don't work really hard on it at the beginning. You, you, you need to start very slowly and build it in a way that you don't put the, the, the shape too, uh, too definite at the beginning. So you can play around and take your time and play with it because it doesn't give you like uh, oil painting a lot of uh, a lot of time to work on it. You have to be uh, more accurate. 
So you have to take it slowly and gently and... Uh, and I, um, I, when I look at these, these in particular and the other of the three men, there's something, the composition uh, is very photographic in a way. It makes me feel like it's a photograph and the use of the charcoal making it kind of out of focus. So it's, it's not, is it, a, is it something that is deliberately out of focus or is, it a, is there a game going on in terms of if this is supposed to be a photographic image or a uh, more of a, a ephemeral, you know, not concrete uh, remembrance of the person. Yes, no, it's, it's supposed to be specific, but the emphasize on this one is the, is the look, is the eyes, ah. especially on this one, on this uh, three. Right. Uh, in the origin, in the exhibition, there was supposed to be, uh, there were five of them, and the five of them for me were there to show that they are looking at you straight. Right. Not apologetic, like saying we are here in a place that we deserve. So the eyes was the most important thing. And the rest is just uh, supporting. They don't have to be very clear and sharp. Uh, I have a question, if I, if I may. Uh, yeah. I know I know there's you, there's Nirit Takala, and I think uh, Mimi, I don't remember the last name, and I, I want Tabessa, right? I, I wanted to ask if there's like a movement you think of like, Ethiopian uh, woman in Israel or artists or are bringing their art right now and, and there's like a place for that in Israel society more than ever. Uh, yes, it's not enough, but it's uh, moving somewhere. Uh, Nirit is really great. She's very successful and she's, uh, she's going abroad. I think she's in New York now and uh, she's, really, really, she's doing really well. And the other one that you're talking about is uh, Mamit. Mamit Michal Worke. She had a solo exhibition in the uh, Herzliya Museum. And there are a lot of uh, younger ones. Uh, they are called the Collective Beta all together. And they are really coming together, not waiting for someone to uh, do the exhibitions for them. Uh, so they are, uh, org they are organized and they are doing uh, and they are uh, showing and uh, they have uh, their own platform, they, own, they have their own small magazine that they are writing about uh, the black experience here. Uh, so it's, uh, it's moving. It's moving uh, towards uh, good things. I'll, I'll just also add and maybe put this a little in context, because I think in the last uh, decade, but mainly also five years uh, with uh, um, the questions of uh, uh, identity politics migrating from the US to, to Israel, we're slowly seeing within the contemporary art world voices of minorities that are taking charge of their own story. Um, so another example from a completely different community is uh, Zoya Chirkaski and her exhibition in the Israel Museum a couple of years ago, Pravda, which actually was really putting forth the the story of the immigration of Jews from Russia in the 90s. And interestingly enough, uh, Zoya is, is uh, part of a small collective called the New Barbizon of five women artists that kind of created also their own little collective and brought their voice and they stand individually as artists, each of them themselves, but also work as a collective. And I think it's interesting to start also on realizing that within Israeli society, we we are slowly having more room to listen to these voices, which were always here, <laughs> but um, weren't necessarily heard um, and now have more space to be both heard and seen. So just to kind of, it, I'd say it's also a much larger um, uh, shift within Israeli society. Um, and within also, I think the, the Ethiopian and Tigist, correct me if I'm wrong, with uh, this generation and their next uh, taking charge of their place within the society rather than like um, accepting 
um, uh, the way it is from others, but rather standing up and saying, we're here, we're taking charge and we will be the ones telling our story. So it's, it's a shift, I'd say it's a larger shift that is not only the Ethiopian community, even though each community has its own characteristics and voices that are coming up. And for sure, also with the movement in the world in general and Black Lives Matter and the tension uh, that also has an impact here. Um, yes. Another good example is the Ars Poetica. Nahon. But we don't have time to go into. <laughs> That's a whole very large yes. different story. But yes, Ars Poetica is a group of poets from uh, the Mizrahi community. Mizrahi is a uh, uh, an umbrella term for Jews descendant of Muslim countries um, and that movement of poets reclaiming the heritage and the Hebrew and telling their own story, which is now actually yeah, about even more than 10 years uh, is I'd say the forerunner of these movements. So it's a very interesting, um, I'd say angle to view uh, uh, Israeli society from and Tigist is definitely one of these prominent voices. So I think, yes, we're in time. <laughs> yeah. uh, Tigis, Todaraba, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I think your work is just amazing. And I'm just so happy that, you know, we were supposed to have three sessions. We ended up with a fourth program and, and it was just great that, that it happened. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Roz, and thank you, Shirel. I'm Milwaukee Jewish Federation. We so appreciate of this cooperation in the last two months. I think we learned a lot. I think th this, you know, uh, this kind of thing that that we have right now. I know it's only because of COVID, in a sense of like uh, we wouldn't done like anything like that online, or virtual. But I can't wait for the opportunity for both of you to visit Milwaukee. I know Russ for sure she'll be here at some point, uh, but maybe also you, Tigist, and for sure you, Shirelle, at some point when, you know, when it will be. <laughs> when we can travel again. Yeah, when we can and travel again. Yes. Yes. So, An artist trip to Israel. Yeah, well, I, I'm hoping that the Federation trip or, or some kind of trip will happen by the end of 2021 or even before. So trying to stay optimistic. So to all of you, all those who are watching us live on Facebook, thank you so much for joining us. Those who is going to watch the recording later, thank you all for joining us. Toda Toda. Toda, toda. Toda.